Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I welcome Chief Executive of the College, Dr. Jayashree Sood, and the faculty of the day, Dr. Ramitar Sagal, Dr. Vijesh Venagobal, Dr. Sumesh Rao, and Dr. Sanish. Well, I believe you are all keeping fine in spite of all the miseries sustained to us by the onslaught of COVID. Today's webinar, we focus on the respiratory physiology. And this webinar, we're going to deal as three different modules. The old broad aspects of the respiratory physiology will be covered in three successive webinars. And schedule one of the webinar is going to be today. And the moderators of the day are Dr. Reminder Sagal and Dr. Vijesh Venugopal. Dr. Reminder Sagal, well, I believe most of you may be knowing, she is one of the senior most educator in anesthesia in the country. She retired as a professor, senior consultant, head of the department, and director of the Department of Anesthesiology at Maulala Asal Medical College. And later she joined as senior consultant at Gangaram Hospital for a short period. After retiring from Gangaram Hospital, she has taken over the job as the editor in chief for the yearbook of anesthesiology. I am sure you would have seen this yearbook of anesthesiology. This is 11th year in continuation, and she is holding the office as chief editor for the seventh year in succession. It's one particular yearbook which is well accepted all over the country and outside, and is matching to some extent to the recent advances in anesthesiology. And thank you, madam for joining this session as moderator. Next moderator is Dr. Vijesh Vanu Gopal. He is one of our young talents. He is a professor and head of the department with one of the medical colleges by name KM City Medical College, Calicut. He is an erudite person, well knowledge, and a lot of academic credits to him. And Dr. Lemindra Sagal and Dr. Vijay Shuranaval will be chairing all the modules of this respiratory physiology discussion. I request Dr. Lemindra Sagal to take over. Ma'am, yeah, your mic is muted. Sorry. So every day, millions of anesthetics are given every day and mostly under general anesthesia and the knowledge of respiratory physiology is paramount. And you will understand that with the new drugs, new uh, you know, technology instrumentation has improved the, with a little bit of uh, mortality mobilities left. But we cannot do without knowledge of respiratory physiology. So rightly so, the Indian College of Anesthesiologists has brought in a series of webinars on respiratory physiology. And today is the module one in which we have two lectures. The first one is on respiratory mechanics and anesthesia. And the second one is on mechanical ventilation under anesthesia. Dr. Sinish, can we have the other... Uh, so this will be followed by the second module, which will be on ventilation perfusion and oxygen and CO2 transport, and followed by the third webinar, which is on pulmonary function test for anesthesiologists, basic airway and the advanced airway equipment and management. And then of course, uh, they'll be followed. I mean, there's going to be further webinars on mechanical ventilation as well. So starting with today's program, I asked Dr. Venu Gopal to introduce the first speaker of the day. Thank you, ma'am. At the outset, I wish to thank Dr. Radhakrishnan, sir, and 
Indian College of Anesthesiologists for the opportunity to be part of the prestigious ICA webinar series on respiratory physiology. In the first session for the day, we will be having a talk on respiratory mechanics and anesthesia. To talk on this topic, we have with us Dr. Subesh Rao, who is Senior Consultant and Anesthesiologist at Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore. He's Associate Professor with more than 14 years of teaching experience in anesthesiology. He's a PG teacher, guide and examiner. Over to you, sir, for the first talk. Dr. Sumesh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yeah, you're audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijish, for the brief but uh, detailed introduction. Mm -hmm. So going on to the topic for the day, what we will be dealing with in the first session is uh, the first half is going to be on lung mechanics. That is the basics of anatomy and the physiology of respiration. So for the residents, this is going to be a brief capsulated version of what happens when we breathe and uh, the gas exchange. So the time is only half hour to, I, I assume I will take about 45 minutes, sorry for that. And the second half, I will be dealing with what are the problems with anesthesia and respiration. So I've been asked to uh, cover basic anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. I think I will skip this part and go right on to the detailed physiology. We will be looking at the resistance and compliance of the lung during breathing, the work of breathing and how we overcome that, what are the problems with uh, uh, increasing or decreasing the work of breathing, the lung volumes and capacities and a brief uh, introduction to measurement of these. These will be dealt with again in the third session coming up in two weeks. Uh, we will also be looking at concepts like the equal pressure point and uh, how uh, anesthesia affects respiration and ventilation. We will also be looking at the control of breathing and the effect of anesthetic agents. So to go right on into the topic. So looking at uh, respiratory physiology and how anesthesia affects the respiratory physiology and how uh, changes in the resp patient's respiration affects anesthesia. Uh, respiration briefly, you know that it is, uh, so uh, as anesthesiologists, our job is to optimize and uh, manage both the respiratory system as well as the circulatory system. So there is no escape from learning these in detail. So it is, uh, it's high effort, you know, you have to understand a lot of, go back to a lot of the physiological concepts and understand them. You also have to know how to apply them in your day to day practice how to do all the calculations on and optimize the patient on your feet while the case is going on and even in the post-operative period. So uh, respiratory physiology, it, you will be tackling it in various forms during your examination. So uh, the, uh, I suggest the first half of the first year should be on completely learning the physiology of respiration and hemodynamics. Coming to respiration, the layman calls it breathing. We know that it comprises of ventilation and respiration. So just to recap, ventilation is the movement of gases or the air exchange, basically the exchange of air from the atmosphere to the alveoli and vice versa. Coming to respiration, it is the basic, what is called as gas exchange or at the tissue level, uh, the exchange of carbon dioxide and uh, other uh, products of respiration of the cells and tissues to oxygen supplied by the lungs through the blood. So this can be external respiration and intern, divided into external and internal respiration. The external respiration is basically the part that we call ventilation. So it is between the atmosphere and the lungs up to the alveoli. The internal respiration is after gas exchange. That means permeability through the, uh, of oxygen through the alveolar membrane to the blood and the hemoglobin formation of oxyhemoglobin and the hemodynamics carrying this oxyhemoglobin to all the tissues. And at the tissue level, the oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide, which is brought back to the lung and exhaled to the atmosphere. So coming to cellular or tissue respiration, which is the most important part. So it can be divided into aerobic and anaerobic. So if we go back to the basic biochemistry, aerobic is in the presence of oxygen where the cycle generates 32 ATPs and anaerobic is in the absence of oxygen and two ATPs are generated. So if we briefly look at the anatomy and the physiology, you know that the muscles of respiration or breathing are the inspiratory muscles and the expiratory muscles. 
So the major inspiratory muscle during normal breathing is the diaphragm. And the contraction of the diaphragm is responsible for 75% of the changes in intrathoracic volume during quiet inspiration. That means 75% of the movement of gases. So this causes the base of the thoracic cavity to descend by about 1.5 to 7 centimeters, depending on the patient's inspiratory effort. So the inspiratory muscles are the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles during quiet or normal breathing. Now, students can remember this as inspiratory, external intercostal, expiratory, the internal intercostal muscles. All right. During forced inspiration, you call a lot of other accessory muscles into play, like the everything from the alien ASI to the sternocleidomastoid, the strap muscles of the neck, the scalene muscles, and the pectoralis major muscles. Coming to expiration, again, the major part of expiration or during normal breathing, it is a passive process just because of the elastic recoil of the lung. So the inflated lung, as we exhale, it uh, just happens to recoil to back to the basal state. During forced expiration, just like in forced inspiration, you call a lot of accessory muscles into play, including the diaphragm and the abdominal, abdominal muscles up to the recti. Coming to the mechanism of the ventilation, that is the movement of air in and out of the lungs, this is especially determined by the impedance of the respiratory system or the resistance to the flow of gases and the alveoli filling up with gas, which we can divide into the elastic resistance and the non-elastic resistance to the gas flow. So the elastic resistance depends on the lung tissue itself. So the alveoli and the interstitial uh, tissue around the alveoli and the degree of elasticity or the elastin present in the, alve uh, in the interstitial tissue and how easily the alveoli expand during inspiration and come back to their basal state, you know, uh, preventing complete collapse during expiration or at end expiration. Now, we should remember that the lung is also a gas liquid interface. So inside the alveoli, you've got the liquid surfactant and outside the lungs, so around the lungs and uh, uh, the pleura, you've got the negative pressure pleural space, which has a little bit of pleural liquid, and you have the uh, lung sliding over the pleura. So coming to the elastic resistance part, the lung and the chest wall both are elastic structures. So they have a, the fibrous supportive tissue of the lungs have a lot of elastin. And in between the lung and chest wall, you have the pleural fluid, which allows the lung to slide easily on the chest wall. But still, the res lung resists being pulled away from the chest wall. This is also important because you don't want complete collapse at the end of expiration. Due to this elastic recoil, the chest wall has a tendency to expand out outwards, and the lungs have a tendency to collapse at the end of quiet expiration. So in the ideal condition, the elastic recoil of the chest wall would be just balanced by the elastic recoil of the lungs. Now, what happens in pathological conditions? Let's say there is a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax. So it's a condition of where the lung is collapsed. So once the chest wall gets opened, the lungs lose their elasticity. The chest wall expands, which is the, uh, you know, the elastic property of the chest wall, and it becomes barrel shaped. Now, the recoil property of the chest wall is due to its structural components. So it resists deformation, and this probably includes the chest wall muscle tone. So you've got a condition where the lungs are collapsed and the chest wall is expanded and further breathing or you know uh, expanding the lungs becomes impossible. So the elastic recoil of the lungs is due to elastin and the surface tension forces acting at the air fluid interface in the alveoli. So now coming to normal physiology and the normal lung, you know that surface tension and the presence of surfactant is the most important factor in maintaining the alveoli open and allowing them to expand easily during inhalation. So if you look at the surface tension forces, so it tends to collapse the lung or collapse the alveoli when the alveoli becomes small at the end of expiration. The surface tension forces reduce the area of interface. They favor alveolar collapse according to the Laplace's law. So the pressure is uh, directly proportional to the surface tension, inversely proportional to the radius. So when the alveoli collapse or the radius becomes smaller, so the pressure required to open them up again would be very much higher. If that is if the surfactant were not present. So the surfactant acts basically like a splint. 
it uh, reduces the surface tension of the alveoli, especially at the end of exhalation. The surfactant, as you know, it is a, a lecithin, a form of protein uh, secreted by the type 2 alveolar pneumocyte. And the ability of the surfactant to lower the surface tension is directly proportional to its concentration within the alveolus. So in conditions like uh, ARDS or where the surfactant is washed off, that is why we have tried to you know, replace artificial surfactant to improve the ventilation and improve the oxygenation across the lungs. So why is surfactant important in the smaller alveoli? You know that as the alveoli becomes smaller or contract, the surfactant becomes more concentrated around the alveolar membrane. This reduces the surface tension and prevents the collapse. Now in larger alveoli, the surfactant is spread out thinner and it's less concentrated. So there's a relative increase in surface tension. So at the end of inspiration, this prevents the over distension of alveoli, but it might also be a disadvantage at the end of expiration where these larger alveoli tend to collapse because the surfactant is, as we said, less concentrated. So the major things, the, the major physical properties determining the efficacy of ventilation would be the compliance and the resistance of the respiratory system as a whole. So this would be the compliance of the lung to expansion and the resistance of the lung and the chest wall or the impedance to expansion. Coming to compliance, you know that it is delta V by delta P or the change in lung volume based on the change in transpulmonary pressure. So we need to know the definitions and the meanings of a lot of pressures here, starting from the transpulmonary pressure, the transpleural pressure, the transbronchial pressure and the alveolar pressure. And then coming to gas exchange, it's a lot of the uh, pressure differences between the alveoli and the arteries and the capillaries and then the tissues and at the venous level. So coming to transpulmonary pressure, it is basically the pressure needed to keep the lung inflated at a certain volume. That is the pressure inside the pleura minus the pressure inside the alveoli. So this is transpulmonary pressure is the transpleural pressure, which is denoted by PPL minus the alveolar pressure, which is denoted by capital P A L. A normal lung compliance would be about 0.2 to 0.3 liter per centimeter of water or in kilopascals, it would be about two to three liters. So if you look at the transpulmonary pressure and the pressure volume relationships within the lung. So the lung, as we said, is an elastic structure and the pleural pressure or the pressure inside the pleura would be lower in the upper regions. So as you go from upper or the apical region towards the base, there is a drop in the transpulmonary pressure, which is the pressure difference between the external to internal. There is a gradual increase in the intrapleural pressure or the pressure within the lung from the apex to the base. A little bit confusing, but look at it this way. The pleural pressure is lower in upper regions. It would be higher in the lower regions. The transpulmonary pressure is higher in the upper regions. It would be lower in the lower regions. There's about a 7.5 centimeters of water drop as we go from the upper to the lower. So the consequences are that the lower lung regions would expand far more or far easier for a given increase in transpulmonary pressure than the upper units do. So when a person is standing up or breathing spontaneously, the ventilation would go preferably to the lower lung regions as a result of the drop in transpulmonary pressure. Now this pressure volume curve, it can go rightwards or leftwards. If it goes right, you know that it is more difficult to expand the lung and vice versa. So there would be a rightward shift of this pressure volume curve in fibrotic lung diseases, idiopathic fibrosis, alveolar proteinosis, granulomatous diseases like sarcoidosis, interstitial and alveolar edema. So basically all of these increase the interstitial pressure or destroy the fibrous or elastic lung tissue, make it more fibrous and make it difficult to expand the lung tissue. There would be a left shift in complete loss of elasticity as an emphysema or in chronic bronchitis or some cases of asthma where there is increased expansion. So if you look at all these disease conditions and superimpose them on the pressure volume curve graph, so you can see that there is a flat, flatter slope with fibrosis. 
so basically there is a, even a small increase in volume would pro produce a large increase in pressure making it difficult to expand the lung and rever reverse of this is seen in conditions like emphysema where there is a shift to the left there is uh, basically there is nearly low no elastic tissue remaining the alveoli are splinted open or kept open all the time and uh, there is a lot of gas uh, so there can also be gas remaining which increases the pressures and the volumes there so this can happen in emphysema asthma and bronchitis so we also already saw that compliance is uh, based on change in volume by increase in transthoracic pressure and the transthoracic pressure here equals the atmospheric pressure minus the intrapleural pressure the normal value of this would be about 0.2 liter per centimeter of water compliance of the chest wall is re also reduced in conditions like obesity generalized edema and some joint disorders like ankylosing spondylitis in which you also have the interstitial tissue of the lungs being affected so the next topic is the lung volumes and capacity so you generally measure four lung volumes or take into account four lung volumes and four capacities so this would be the tidal volume which is the volume of air uh, which is the normal or uh, quiet gas exchange that is a volume of air that is expired and inspired during a normal breath then you have the inspiratory reserve volume which is the maximum additional volume that can be inspired above the former that is the tidal volume the expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume that can be expired below the tidal volume that means tidal volume and then what additional volume can be forced out of the lungs so what remains in the lungs would be the residual volume of gas which is the volume remaining after maximal exhalation that is the maximum effort you take to exhale and the functional residual capacity would be so let's look at this graph it will make it easier so that is normal tidal volume breathing the inspiratory reserve volume would be the tidal volume plus the maximum you can breathe in with a full inspiratory effort the inspiratory capacity would be a total of tv plus the uh, irv the expiratory reserve volume would be what you can exhale the maximum from the normal expiratory effort and the functional so you have the residual volume that is remaining beyond the expiratory reserve volume the functional residual capacity would be the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume and the addition of all of these would give you the total lung capacity coming to the frc which is very important for us as anesthesiologists it is we have seen that it is the sum total of the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume the frc is determined by the balance between the inward elastic recoil of the lungs and the outward recoil of the thoracic cage at the end of expiration the frc is important because it is the degree of latitude we have with the oxygenation of the patient it also directly determines the amount of time that we have for airway management and airway control so the frc decreases with paralysis and with whatever anesthesia we provide the patient the other factors which would affect the frc is body size the height increases the frc by about 32 to 51 ml per cm the gender affects the functional residual capacity it is less in women than men and supine posture or change in position of the patient from erect to supine would decrease the frc by about 0.5 to 1 liter in an adult and that's a normal adult in lung pathology this would be much higher so various lung pathologies can affect the frc by decreasing it so how do we measure the frc we need a spirometer and a body box so we need techniques like nitrogen washout or a helium wash in or total body plethysmography so this can be asked in the theory exam so uh, a detailed reading of the techniques is recommended coming to the closing volume so all the we saw that all the small airways the terminal alveoli so these lack the cartilaginous support so they depend on the surfactant to keep them open they also depend on some amount of splinting by the gas left behind after a normal expiration so these alveoli being open would depend on the radial traction caused by the elastic recoil of the surrounding tissue which will tend to keep them open and the volume above the residual volume that means 
we saw that the residual volume is at the end of a maximal expiratory effort, right? The volume above this during expiration at which the terminal airways begin to close during expiration is called the closing volume. Coming to closing capacity, the sum of the residual volume and the closing volume is what we term the closing capacity. So this airway closure, especially in the terminal and small alveoli at the lung basis, it's a normal physiological phenomenon, which is accelerated or ex extenuated by anesthesia. And it is the enhanced by anesthesia. It is also the effect of increasing the pleural pressure during expiration. So the pleural pressure tends to expand or become larger during expiration. And when it becomes positive, it will exceed the pressure inside the airways which is at this time, it is at just or nearly equal to atmospheric pressure at the low flow rate at the end of uh, the expiratory pause. So higher pressure outside than inside will compromise the airway, will not allow it to expand and may lead to airway collapse or closure. So if we look at the pressure gradients here, so this is in a standing patient. So there's a vertical, pleural pressure gradient with a difference of approximately, we already saw this with a, the pleural, pleural pressure gradient would be approximately 7.5 centimeters between the apical region to the lung basis. So there is a higher pressure inside the airway coming to the lower part. This causes a transpulmonary pressure gradient. So a higher pressure would be required to open the alveolus and the airways in the lower parts. And at the end of expiration, this would also result in closure of the airways in the lower part. So in young subjects or normal people uh, under quiet breathing and under their own power, spontaneous respiration, the airway closure may not occur until we make them expire to residual volume. So in the normal conditions, it might not occur. And even these alveoli are open. When age increases and it goes to about 65 to 70 years, the airway closure may occur above the FRC. So in these elderly people, the dependent regions are intermittently closed during breathing. And that is also why arterial oxygenation decreases with age. So there is a physiological shunt as well as a shunt in the respiratory system. Now coming to a supine position, the FRC is again reduced, whereas the closing capacity is not affected by the body position. So the CC can approach the FRC and so closure of airways may occur even above FRC, even if the subjects are young and normal. Coming to the elderly, this would be accelerated. So in the supine position, the airways may be continuously closed if the closing capacity exceeds the FRC plus the tidal volume. And airway closure also would occur in at higher lung volumes in patients with other disease conditions like obstructive lung diseases, secretions or edema of the airway wall and increased bronchial muscle tone in asthma, chronic bronchitis, etc. So coming to vital capacity, it is the maximum volume of air which can be expelled from, expelled from the lungs by a forceful expiration following a maximum forceful inspiration in addition to the body habitus. So maximum inspiration followed by maximum expiration. This is dependent obviously on the respiratory muscle strength and the effort that the patient can take to overcome the work of breathing and the resistance of the lung to maximum uh, expansion. It also depends on the chest and the lung compliance to expansion. The normal vital capacity is about 60 to 70 ml per kg. So the opposite of compliance or delta P by delta V is resistance, which we saw it could be elastic or non-elastic. Coming to non-elastic part of the resistance, normal total airway resistance is about 0.5 to 2 centimeters of water, which is mainly contributed by the medium-sized bronchi. So why medium size? The larger airways, the resistance is low because of the large diameter flows are more easy. In the smaller airways, resistance can again be accounted for to be lower because of the large total cross-sectional area. You've heard the old adage that if all the alveoli are opened out and put together, you would have the length of two or three football fields, right? So that leads to an increase in the interface for respiration and expansion. So the most important causes of an increased airway resistance would be bronchospasm, secretions, mucosal edema, volume-related and flow-related airway collapse. 
so the upper alveoli or the larger airways they have a cartilaginous uh, uh, part in their wall which keeps them splinted open the lower airways if there is an obstruction in the middle part there would be some amount of autopy or gas present in the alveoli at the end of expiration so they may still tend to be open so the maximum airway resistance would be in the middle part that is the medium sized uh, bronchi and bronchioles which are affected by all these changes in resistance and compliance coming to a volume related airway collapse at lower volumes the airway resistance becomes inversely proportional to lung volumes and increasing the lung volume up to back up to normal by providing a positive end expiratory pressure or peep can reduce this airway resistance if you look at the flow and how it affects the airway collapse during a forced expiration there is reversal of the normal transmural airway pressure and this can call, cause collapse of these airways or dynamic airway compression so earlier we saw all the static changes so here in forced expiration there could be dynamic airway collapse this is because of you are generating a positive pleural pressure and a large pressure drop across the intrathoracic airway between the alveoli and the atmosphere so there is a concept called the epp or the equal pressure point which can also be a short note in the exam it can also be asked in the viva about how the epp is affected by disease conditions so the epp is this point at the airway where the dynamic compression occurs so there would be basically a constriction of the or a fall uh, you can say a collapse or closure of the bronchi at this part so flow would not occur beyond the equal pressure point because the transpleural pressure becomes equal to the intra alveolar pressure at this juncture so in the normal person you know normal young adult who is breathing spontaneously this equal pressure point is usually at the larger airways which have the cartilaginous component you wouldn't have the collapse and uh, you know the uh, ventilation getting affected but in disease conditions this equal pressure point moves towards the smaller airways anesthesia also can cause the same thing and as lung volume decreases the ventilation is affected and there is collapse of the alveoli so disease conditions like emphysema and asthma also predispose a patient to this dynamic airway compression because the elastic tissues that normally support the smaller airways are destroyed so we were on vital capacity we have to uh, so to look at the uh, efficacy of ventilation or the ease of functioning of the lung we have to look at the fast vital capacity and measures of the fvc and how they are affected by diseases so measuring the vital capacity as an exhalation that is maximal that is as hard as, as rapid as the patient can possibly do it gives us important information about the work of breathing and the airway resistance so if we take the fev1 that is the first expiratory volume of 1 second and the total first vital capacity so we know that is an important measure of the lung function the ratio of the fev1 to fvc is proportionate to the degree of airway obstruction so if you are allowed to do only one test of pulmonary function so this would be the ideal for you so you can measure the fev1 by fvc ratio the normal should be more than 80% the next or the next ideal uh, measure of the pulmonary function or the ventilatory function is the uh, mmefr that is the first mid expiratory flow or the fev between 25 to 75% which is also an effort independent uh, measure and it is a more reliable measurement of obstruction so we have seen that the work of breathing is what we need to overcome during spontaneous or assisted ventilation and let's look at the components that make up this work of breathing during quiet inspiration we have already seen that it can be divided into elastic work and non elastic work the non elastic work would be the basic airway resistance itself which uh, contributes to about 25 28% of the total resistance then there is also viscous resistance of about 77% so this viscous resistance is the viscosity of the lung tissue itself or how it resists expanding and then it can also be the viscosity of the gas that is used for ventilation and uh, function of the flow so coming to elastic work which is about 65% so we have already seen what are the components of the elastic work what are the factors that increase the elastic work and thus affect the work of breathing 
So we all also needed to look at the ventilation percussion relationships, how they function ideally, how they are affected in a spontaneously breathing patient and in a ventilated patient, how the ventilation and perfusion ratio differs from the apex to the base. So all this will be dealt with in the second part of the respiratory physiology uh, discussion, which would be coming up next week. So if you look at ventilation, so which we were talking about so far, this is the sum of all the exhaled volumes in one minute or the maximum minute ventilation. So if the tidal volume is constant, you assume that there is a constant respiratory rate, the tidal volume is equal during uh, this measured minute and the minute ventilation would be the product of the respiratory rate and the tidal volume. For an average young adult at rest, the minute ventilation is about five liters per minute. Now, conditions are not ideal, even in the normal person, some of the inspiratory gas remains in the airway at the end of exhalation or du even during inspiration, and it does not take part in alveolar gas exchange. So this would be called the dead space. We know that the dead space can be apparatus dead space. That is whatever mass airways and other airway equipment that we are using can add on to the dead space of the patient. This can also be anatomical dead space and physiological or alveolar dead space. So inside the patient, you've got the anatomical dead space and the alveolar dead space. So the anatomical dead space is the upper airways basically, which do not take part in the gas exchange. So it's related to a volume of the conducting passages up to the uh, middle and terminal bronchioles and alveoli, which have respiratory membrane. So the alveolar dead space would be those alveoli that are well ventilated, meaning there is gas entering the alveoli and expanding it, but they are poorly perfused, which means that carbon dioxide is not brought back to these alveoli and there is no exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide. So this is basically wasted ventilation. And when you take the total physiological dead space, that would be the sum of the anatomical and the alveolar dead space. In the upright position, in a spontaneously breathing patient, this would be normally about 150 ml for a normal adult. That's about 2 ml per kg. If you want to calculate the dead space in any of your patients, it's approximately 30% of tidal volume. So you take the VD by VT, the ventilation by the, uh, the diffusion by the tidal volume, it would also be given by the PaCO2, where the A is the alveolar carbon dioxide tension minus the mixed expired CO2 tension by, again, the PaCO2, and the ratio would be about 0.3. So what are the factors affecting this dead space? So this can be patient-based factors as well as our manipulations. So coming to posture, an upright posture would actually increase the dead space because the you know, the lungs expand, the thorax descends, and the airways are more open. A supine position would decrease the anatomical dead space. Again, the position of the airway also affects the anatomical dead space. The neck extension opens up the spaces, you know, the uh, below the tongue and the hypopharynx. So neck extension can increase the anatomical dead space by a little, while flexion would reduce it. Age, there is a lot of tissues that do not respond or do not take part in ventilation. So age increases the total physiological dead space. Artificial airways would decrease the dead space, meaning the end of the tube or the end of the airway is where you calculate the oxygenation starting and or the ventilation starting. And this would be lead to a drop in the anatomical dead space. Positive pressure ventilation, you've got increased dead space. Anticholinergics would increase the dead space again because they are relaxing the uh, bronchi, especially the middle part of the bronchi. Uh, pulmonary embolism, of course, would have to increase the dead space. Hypotension would have to increase the dead space because there's no perfusion of some of the ventilated alveoli. And diseases like emphysema, there is loss of elasticity and there is an increase in the dead space because a lot of alveoli are splintered open. Coming to hypoxemia and hypercapnia, our entire job during anesthesia is to maintain normoxemia and normocapnia. Hypoxia can affect the patient. Uh, it can be deadly for the patient, of course. Hypercapnia affects all the ventilatory uh, mechanisms and the work of breathing. So we aim to reduce or uh, avoid hypoxia and hypercapnia during anesthesia. So we have to avoid hypoventilation and other factors which lead to hypoxia and accumulation of carbon dioxide. 
So this would be a ventilation perfusion mismatch leading to shunting and deoxygenated blood past the lungs into the systemic circulation and also conditions which cause an impairment of diffusion or a pathological or grossly abnormal lung. Coming to hypoventilation, it is defined as ventilation that results in a PaCO2 more than 45 milli, uh, millimeters of mercury, the normal being 35 to 45. So you wouldn't want hyperventilation or hypoventilation. You want to stay within a physiological range of carbon dioxide because that is the strongest uh, factor which increases the respiratory effort. So hypoventilation can be present in an anesthetized patient even when you are providing, you think you are providing a high minute ventilation. If the metabolic demand increases because of patient factors, everything from fever to pathological conditions, or if the dead spaces inadvertently increase. This can be by alveolar collapse, compression, kinking, etc. Coming to a transport of gases, which is the second half of uh, ventilation and respiration. So this is especially oxygen transport and CO2 transport. I think you're going to see this in the subsequent sessions as well. So most of the oxygen is carried in the blood as oxyhemoglobin. And you know the oxygen carrying capacity, the hemoglobin carries about 1.39 ml of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin. You will need to read up on factors affecting the oxygen carrying capacity and disease conditions. So to know the gas exchange at the tissue level, you also need to know all about the normal adult hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. So this curve gives you, so it shows you the total oxygen, which is about 100% at, uh, in ideal conditions at the alveoli and the dissolved oxygen in the plasma. The remaining is the oxygen that is combined with the hemoglobin. So there is a drop in the sigmoid shape drop in the graph as you go from the alveolar level where the hemoglobin is supposed to be 100% or the maximal infused with oxygen to the tissue level where I, in the ideal condition, you would expect that the hemoglobin would give up all its oxygen to the tissues or to the cells and take up carbon dioxide. So in disease conditions, you've got a shift to the right of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve or a shift to the left. So a shift to the left would mean that the curve would come somewhere, you know, it would end up somewhere above zero. So, which means that at the cellular or tissue level, the hemoglobin is not releasing oxygen, causing tissue hypoxia to anoxia. So, a rightward shift, which you might think would be, of, uh, you know, better for the patient or the hemoglobin gives up oxygen more readily to the patient's tissues, would happen in conditions like increased CO2 concentration, increase in temperature, increase 2,3 dpg or in conditions of acidosis as a defense mechanism. So, and uh, so, sorry, that should be, uh, yeah, acidosis, decrease PO2 and anemia. There would be a left shift of the hemoglobin dissociation curve where you still have a persistence of the fetal hemoglobin or fetal blood in adults in various disease conditions, in alkalosis, in decreased temperature and where you have got decreased 2,3 dpg. Coming to carbon dioxide transport, it is carried mainly in three forms in the blood. The dissolved carbon dioxide in plasma as bicarbonate in the buffer system and as carbamino compound, which is a major form, about 75 to 80%. This would be especially as carbamino hemoglobin in combination with the hemoglobin. So now we come to the, so we have taken a brief but hurried look at the anatomy and the respiratory physiology and how the lung works during breathing and what are the factors affecting the compliance or resistance, the ventilation, the factors keeping the alveoli open, and what are the disease conditions causing problems in all of these, the factors causing hypoxemia or hypercarbia, and what are the problems affecting the uh, gas exchange at the tissue level. Now, if you look at what we are doing to the patient, that is the respiratory function during anesthesia, what you should know is whether you think the patient is awake and spontaneously breathing, you've given local anesthetic, or you've gone a muscle relaxant and other drugs which affect the uh, ventilatory drive as well as the respiratory muscles. So in general anesthesia, so all of these reduce the respiratory function of the patient and increase the work of breathing. So if you look at the lung volumes under anesthesia, so just by making the patient lie down, by changing the patient from upright position to supine, the FRC is reduced by 0.8 to 1 liter in a young adult. 
So remember that in disease conditions or in older people, this might all be exaggerated. Once you induce anesthesia, there will be another 0.4 to 0.5 liter decrease in the FRC. So the end expiratory lung volume is thus reduced from approximately 3.5 liters to 2 liters under anesthesia. And this 2 liters is, you know that you are coming rather close or becoming equal to the residual volume. So your ventilation has to take into account the total ventilation of the patient. Anesthesia per se causes a fall in the functional residual capacity despite maintenance of spontaneous breathing. So that's why I said, even if you are giving a local anesthetic or a block, it can be, it can affect the respiratory uh, pattern and the work of breathing. So the resistance of the total respiratory system and the lungs during anesthesia increases in both spontaneous breathing as well as mechanical ventilation. Now, the most important part concerning us is the atelectasis and airway closure during the anesthesia and even in the post-anesthetic recovery period. So general anesthesia causes accelerated atelectasis, especially at the basal part of the lung, which requires you know, splinting uh, and proper surfactant to keep the alveoli open. This atelectasis happens in approximately 90% of all the patients who are anesthetized. It can be seen both during spontaneous breathing and also after muscle paralysis. It can also be seen whether you are giving an IV anesthetic or an inhaled anesthetic. So even during an uneventful anesthetic, about 15 to 20% of the uh, lung is regularly collapsed at the lung basis. So there are factors increasing or decreasing this so after thoracic surgery, cardiopulmonary bypass, you've got more than 50% of the basal lung, which has collapsed even several hours after surgery. So it shows the importance of post-operative oxygenation or supplementation of oxygen. Now this amount of atelectasis decreases towards the apex, which is mostly spared. There is also a weak correlation with obesity and the body weight of the patient. So obese patients show larger atelectatic areas than normal patients or lean ones. And this atelectasis is independent of age. So children and young people can even have as much atelectasis as the elderly patient. So basically, this is a factor that you have to keep in mind when you deal with all of your patients. And if there is COPD, these people might have an artificial or autopeep or splinting of the alveolus. So there might be less or even no atelectasis during up to the first 45 minutes of anesthesia in these patients. Now, we don't know what is the actual physiological mechanism that prevents the lung from total collapse, but this may be airway closure occurring before alveolar collapse takes place, or it may be the altered balance between the two opposing forces, that is the chest wall and the lung that uh, counters a decrease in the lung dimension. So if you look at the changes in all these physiological functions during anesthesia, so that's an awake patient and an anesthetized patient. So there is a cranial shift of the diaphragm when the patient lies down in the supine position and there is a decrease in the transverse diameter of the thorax. So both of these would reduce the intrathoracic volume and increase the resistance to ventilation or expansion. This would also lower the functional residual capacity and the oxygen reserve of the patient. So if you look at anesthesia itself, so there is decreased ventilated volume, especially atelectasis and airway closure in the terminal lungs. And this would be a possible cause of reduced lung compliance and increased resistance to breathing. This decreased airway dimension can also lead to lowered FRC and increase in the resistance. So how do we prevent this complication from occurring? Can we prevent atelectasis during anesthesia? We can, of course, try interventions like the application of 10 centimeter water or positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP to splint the alveolus open. So this is, has been seen in studies to consistently reopen collapsed lung tissue, provided you can safely give PEEP in the presence of elastic tissue. Why do these shunts occur in atelectasis? It's because of a redistribution of blood flow towards a more dependent and at this time, the collapsed part of the lungs where there is no effective ventilation happening when the intrathoracic pressure is increased by the PEEP. So under such circumstances, after you give PEEP, any persistent atelectasis in the bottom of the lung 
receives a larger share of the pulmonary blood flow than without P. So this increased intrathoracic pressure under anesthesia impedes the venous return and decreases the cardiac output. So you also have the circulation getting affected, that is the gas transport from the alveoli to the tissues. So this also results in a lower venous oxygen tension for a given oxygen uptake. You think you are giving 100% oxygen, but what is actually reaching the tissue would be a lower level than the physiological uh, tissue respiration. So this also reduces the arterial and venous oxygen tension. And under anesthesia, the lung can recollapse rapidly after discontinuation of PEEP. So you are giving PEEP to keep the alveoli open, but uh, it can also have the side effect that, so it's just like some drugs, you know, you discontinue the antihypertensive, there is a, a rapid hypertension occurring. So this is just like that. Once PEEP is discontinued, it is seen that within a minute, the collapses as large as previous before the application of P. So the importance of maintenance of muscle tone uh, is what we have shown by all these. So how do you maintain the muscle tone? By using an anesthetic that uh, does not paralyze the muscles, that prevents atelectasis from forming. So you've got drugs like ketamine, which does not impair or actually increases the muscle tone and does not cause the collapse. The only way in which it can affect respiration would be spasm or secretions. You can also use other techniques to restore the respiratory muscle tone to normal, such as uh, they have experimentally, they have tried pacing of the diaphragm by applying phrenic nerve stimulation, which was found to reduce the atelectatic area after general anesthesia. You can also use recruitment manuals, that is the sigh or a double tidal volume to reopen any collapsed lung tissue, especially the basal alveoli. But for complete reopening of all the collapsed lung tissues, you would need an inflation pressure of about 40 centimeters of water. So such a large inflation corresponds to a maximum spontaneous inspiration or the vital capacity maneuver. If there is loss of elasticity, you cannot go on doing this uh, for fear of causing a barotrauma or a volute trauma. You can also minimize the gas resorption at the lungs by, uh, you know, we usually give uh, a vital capacity manure when the patient is recovering from anesthesia, we have a tendency to put the gas flow or the fresh gas flow to 100% oxygen. So we give pure oxygen for some time, uh, thinking that this will improve the ventilation and help the patient to breathe easier and recover back to normal. But what is the problem with this? We can, so there can be alveoli that get, you know, 100% oxygen ventilated inside. There's no perfusion or uh, the perfusion is not effective. There is shunting. So what happens is all the oxygen gets absorbed. And after that, the alveoli collapse, which can cause atelectasis. So this can be prevented by giving a maximum of about 40% of oxygen for ventilation, uh, even at the end of the anesthetic procedure. So the atelectasis would uh, resolve or would reappear only very slowly. And uh, 40 minutes after the vital capacity maneuver, only very little of the initial atelectasis had reappeared. So that is giving 100% oxygen at the end of the anesthesia. What about pre-oxygenation? So it's our normal practice to give about 100% oxygen for a few minutes before and during the commencement of the general anesthetic. So we think that it gives us a higher margin of safety. It will give us more time to intubate the airway, especially in a difficult airway and we can have a more prolonged apneic period. So what is the problem with this? So again, this 100% ventilation with 100% oxygen can cause collapse of the terminal affected alveoli. If we avoid this pre-oxygenation or we ventilate, so no, normal atmospheric ventilation is about 20 to 25% of oxygen. We can give about 30 to 50% of oxygen for pre-oxygenation, especially in normal subjects. This was, this was found to eliminate the atelectasis formation during the induction and subsequent anesthesia and also reduce the atelectasis at the end of the surgery or at recovery from anesthesia and coming back to awakening. You can also try pre-oxygenation with a CPAP or a continuous positive airway pressure to avoid the appearance of atelectasis. So why do these airways close under anesthesia? So this intermittent closure, you know, it can be, uh, it can reduce the ventilation and it can be detrimental to the ventilation of dependent lung regions 
where atelectasis starts happening. So these lung regions would become low ventilation perfusion units where the shunting occurs and uh, provides a deoxygenated uh, blood in the circulation. So our anesthesia was already causing a reduction in the FRC by about 0.4 to 0.5 liters. So we can anticipate that this airway closure will become more prominent in the anesthetized subject and will cause a more uh, will cause more harm to the normal physiology. So can we explain this impaired oxygenation during anesthesia? Let's look at a three compartment lung model for that. So you've got the pleura, the negative uh, space inside the pleural cavity and the lungs. Then you've got the bronchi, the uh, terminal bronchi and the alveoli. So looking at the upper part of the lung, so here the, it's easy to ventilate this part. The alveoli and the airways are always open. So this would be called, we can call it zone A. Coming to a second part, the middle and the lower parts of the airways are, uh, so during inspiration or during your ventilation, you are opening up these alveoli. But during expiration, there can be the equal, uh, the equal pressure point can go downwards into the middle to terminal alveoli. And uh, you can have no ventilation beyond this point. At the bottom of the lung, you've got the maximum perfusion. Uh, if the patient is, you know, head up or at the dependent uh, portion, if the patient is supine and the alveoli would be collapsed here and there would be no ventilation with the presence of perfusion, which is a physiological shunt. So how do you uh, distribute this ventilation better or what can you do to improve this problem? So ventilation, you can see under anesthesia, it's distributed mainly to the upper lung regions and there is a successive decrease down to the lower or the more dependent parts of the lung. Coming to giving positive end expiratory pressure, the PEEP can increase the ventilation in the dependent lung, even in anesthetized subjects, whether they are supine or lateral. There can be a more even distribution between the upper and lower lung regions under anesthesia in supine humans if there is, there has been an effort to previously inflate the lung similar to the feet. So we can restore the overall functional residual capacity towards or beyond the awake level and uh, by this. And if we can do that, then we are returning the gas dis distribution towards the awake pattern and reducing the work of breathing for the awake patient when he comes out of the anesthesia. So PEEP, what we have been saying is positive end expiratory pressure can cause a redistribution of blood flow toward the dependent lung regions and forcing blood volume, this blood volume downwards to the dorsal side of the lungs may increase the fractional blood flow to an atelectatic region or cause a shunt. So we saw that the third part of the discussion after a couple of weeks will include, include the de dead space and the uh, discussion of the shunts. So we'll not be going into that in detail. I think the time is also nearly finished. So we will see these later in subsequent uh, topics. So coming to the effects of the anesthetic drugs themselves on the respiratory drive, spontaneous breathing is frequently reduced during anesthesia and inhaled anesthetics as well as intravenous anesthetics reduce sensitivity to the carbon dioxide or reduce the respiratory drive. Anesthesia also reduces the physiological response to hypoxia and attenuates the hypoxic response. So this may be due to an effect on the carotid body chemoreceptors. So because it was outside the scope of this discussion, we did not discuss about the control of breathing and respiration. So postgraduates may please read up or revise the control of breathing again, the central control as well as the neural and the chemical control. So the factors that... Uh, affect all this during anesthesia, uh, during spontaneous breathing, we saw that the FRC was reduced and the lower dependent part of the diaphragm, it was moved up, reducing the intrathoracic volume and increasing the pressure. With muscle paralysis, the upper non-dependent part of the lung showed the largest displacement. When you look at the oxygen fraction, if you are increased, so we already discussed this, if we are going from the normal physiological oxygenation to 100%, as you increase the FiO2, you might also get an increase in the shunt fraction because of the atelectasis at the terminal alveoli and alveoli that are perfused, but there is no gas exchange occurring there. 
So there is a certain dependence on the level of the FiO2 that you are giving to the patient. So you don't, uh, basically we should avoid overdoing it. So 0.3 to 0.5 would be advised under general anesthesia to prevent the attenuation of the HPV response and further development of atelectasis and shunting in the lower lung unit or the dependent lung unit. You can also alter the body position of the patient. So if you can avoid the full lying down pose or if you can do some more upright position, you might also lead to better ventilation of the formerly dependent lung areas. Coming to age, so you know that increasing age affects the arterial oxygenation, which is much less in elderly people. There is also an increasing ventilation perfusion mismatch, and there is impaired gas exchange at the extremes of age. Younger patients, it might be due to a shunt. Older patients, it's because the lung tissue itself is gone. There is uh, no uh, effective gas exchange or the interface, and the mismatch becomes more important. Obesity, we already saw that it affects the work of breathing as well as the ventilation. It also worsens the oxygenation of blood and there is a reduced FRC which promotes airway closure much earlier and to a greater extent than in lean subjects. Smokers can also have an impairment of gas exchange because of infection, uh, destruction of the alveolar basement membrane and other factors. This difference also persists and is increased during anesthesia. So is regional anesthesia safe? You keep the patient awake, you give a block. So are you doing the right thing for the patient? Even regional anesthesia in the supine position can affect the ventilation of the patient. And it depends on the type and extension of the motor blockade that you are giving. So if you have a higher spinal or an extensive block, which includes all the thoracic and lumbar segments, the inspiratory capacity is reduced and the expiratory reserve volume approaches zero. So a much higher chance of hypoxia and hypercarbia. But even then, the diaphragmatic function may be spared. But interestingly, the patient might still be able to breathe because of diaphragmatic excursions. But of course, he will not be feeling the movement of breathing. So he also panics and this is added on top of the hypoxia. So what we saw in this uh, lengthy and mostly theoretical session was the physiology of the uh, actual ventilation and respiration, the gas exchange, the transport of gases from the alveoli to the tissues and what happens at the tissue level and how our anesthesia affects the function of the lungs. What are the factors that keep the lungs open and well ventilated and what are the factors that lead to atelectasis? How can we prevent the atelectasis and uh, bring the patient back to a more physiological breathing? And how do anesthetics affect the ventilatory function and how we can attenuate or improve this uh, problem due to ventilation? So that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you all for your patient hearing. We will take, we'll be taking questions at the end of all the sessions today. Thank you, Dr. Sumesh, for a comprehensive talk on the basics of lung mechanics. The talk shall be opened up for discussion after the second session. Meanwhile, the audience can put in their queries and comments in the chat box. We shall take them up one by one after the second session is over. Now, I would like to request Segal ma'am to introduce the topic and speaker for the second session. Thank you, Dr. Venugopal. So, like I said in the beginning of my uh, this uh, session, that uh, anesthesia is safer than ever before. But one thing which is cause of concern even now is the post-operative pulmonary complications to, in which the mechanical ventilation plays a large part. So today we have Dr. Sanish to talk about mechanical ventilation and in anesthesia. Dr. Sanish is a consultant anesthesiology and ICU in Anantapuri Hospital, Trivandrum. And he's authored two books, one review of in clinical anesthesiology for postgraduates and second textbook for anesthesia technicians. He also hosts a website, onlineanesthesiatools.com and has a YouTube channel, Anesthesia Tools for Video Tutorials in Anesthesia and ICU. And rightly so, that he's been made the coordinator for ICA webinars by the, by the college. And he's also a co-founder of Webinar Campus, webinar-based teaching and acute medicine specialities. So today he will be speaking on mechanical ventilation in anesthesia. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, for the kind words of introduction. And it's my pleasure and um, I'm very happy to be part of 
ICA Indian College of Anesthesiologist uh, webinars. And this is module one on respiratory physiology. It's very uh, a happy occasion to continue with uh, uh, Dr. Sumesh Rao's uh, lecture because he has covered most of the topics well in advance so that I can rush through my topics. Thank you, Dr. Sumesh, for the uh, wonderful opening lecture. Um, I remember during my PG days, one of my teachers uh, used to ask most of my colleagues, what is ventilation, what is respiration? Till then, I was thinking that uh, both are almost the same. Then I realized that uh, ventilation is just the moment of a uh, volume of gas into and out of the lungs. Just like you say, this room is ventilated. I think this concept was already done, uh, explained by Dr. Sumesh, but um, I take this opportunity because most of our audience joined slightly late. So, uh, one second. But when it comes to respiration, it actually involves an exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide across a membrane. And when it happens in the lung, we call it as external respiration. And when it happens at the cellular level, we call it as internal respiration. So what, do we, what it has to do with our topic and why we should be ventilating the patient under anesthesia. There are good enough reasons already explained. One, under anesthesia, brainstem respiratory centers are depressed respiratory mechanics are altered. We have already discussed that. And three, gas exchange is affected. So what our ventilators are doing will be, it creates a, the best possible environment for the respiration to happen. It keeps the lung units open, minimizes the uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. These are the objectives by uh, with which uh, we are doing mechanical ventilation. These are the foundations or fundas behind setting the ventilator parameters. So what is the role of mechanical ventilation? We already discussed there are changes in respiratory mechanics under anesthesia. There are altered gas exchange happening in under anesthesia. So all these things will lead on to post-operative pulmonary complications. The moment we institute mechanical ventilation and try to optimize the conditions, we can actually prevent it. So that is the idea of, or the role of mechanical ventilation under anesthesia. Pulmonary consequences of general anesthesia, we already discussed uh, regarding closing volume and functional residual capacity. Under anesthesia, FRC reduces, the venous admixture increases, dead space increases. We are actually adding an extra component called apparatus dead space. And even the physiological dead space increases during IPPV or positive pressure ventilation. Let us see what are the factors leading to perioperative hypoxemia. It could be patient related factors or procedure related factors. The patient related factors say the patient age group or the category like infants, morbidly obese, pregnancy, these category patients have classically reduced FRC. When it comes to COPD smokers and elderly, the closing volume is increased. Let's go to the procedure related factors. Patient positioning is a factor leading to FRC reduction. Example will be Trendelenburg position, lithotomy position and sometimes steep lithotomy position. Use of high inspired oxygen without PEEP can lead to absorption atelectasis. And when the duration of procedure is long, there is always a possibility of progressive lung de-recruitment. Now, how do we manage mechanical ventilation during anesthesia? First, we start with pre-oxygenation. Our aim is to have complete denitrogenation. If possible, you can do it for a period of five minutes. Then what about absorption atelectasis? So there is some, uh, there are some literatures 
mentioning that a small reduction in the inspired oxygen concentration from say 100% to 80% during induction of anesthesia pre-oxygenation will only modestly reduce the non-hypoxic apnea time, whereas it effectively prevents atelectasis. Again, another option will be application of CPAP during pre-oxygenation phase, say a six centimeter of water of CPAP using face mask. Uh, this allows compensation for the anesthesia induced FRC reduction that increases the duration of non-hypoxic apnea, prevents atelectasis formation and improves the intraoperative oxygenation also. So now I would like to listen from you what kind of uh, mechanical ventilation management you are doing for your routine cases. I'm not uh, speaking about uh, specialized category patients like uh, lung isolation, etc. So just to hear from you, which mode of ventilation do you prefer in routine general anesthesia? Is it volume control ventilation? Is it pressure control ventilation? Is it SIME mode or if your anesthesia workstation has only volume control mode. I am posting the poll window now. I request if uh, all of you can give your options. Yeah, fine. Happy to see the quick response from a good number of uh, attendees. This is just a discussion. Like uh, I'm not telling about any guideline discussion just to know our practice how we are doing our routine general anesthesia. Remember, I am not speaking about specialized population. Okay, fine, I will close the poll in another um, 10 seconds. I think more people can vote now because it's only about your practice. Yeah, fine. So this is the expected answer, okay. So this is what happens in most of the centers. So everybody is happy with volume control ventilation, right? So only 7% said uh, only VCV is available. So I assume that the 78% who said volume control ventilation, they also have access to other modes of ventilation as well. Okay, thank you for your response. Anyway, we will have more uh, uh, audience questions during our uh, question answer interactive sessions. So volume control ventilation, what are we doing? This is the, um, I think this workstation, Datexomeda workstation is available in many centers. Okay, what we are setting will be, we'll be setting a tidal volume, we'll be setting a respiratory rate, we can manipulate the IE ratio, we can add beep if you want to, and of course we'll adjust the FiO2 at the level of flow control knob or flow meters. So these are our regular settings, right? Okay, if you come to this machine, here actually we can see the uh, flow versus time graphics and pressure versus time graphics. So this is what I would like to bring your attention to. Here actually we see a constant flow, square wave pattern of flow versus time pattern. You can see the pressure hits a maximum and then comes down. Similarly, volume also goes up, hits the set value and then proceeds to the exhalation phase. Okay, this ventilator, this anesthesia workstation also gives other uh, respiratory mechanics indicators like compliance. Yes, it gives uh, mechanical uh, minute ventilation, okay, uh, the expired tidal volume, etc. So the point I want you to concentrate is the flow pattern. On During volume control mode, we are setting the tidal volume, respiratory rate, IE ratio, we can add PEEP, and FAO2 we are setting at the flow control valves. And we are using constant flow, inspiratory flow, square wave pattern, and the pressure hits a peak and then comes down. Here actually we are controlling the volume. We are telling the machine, I need 450 ml of tidal volume at a rate of 14 breaths per minute. You can have one third of uh, time for inspiration and two third for exhalation. I need to keep an end expiratory pressure of positive end expiratory pressure of five centimeters of water. FAO2 I have already adjusted. 
So what you need to remember is pressure, airway pressure, PAW, like you see here, is a dependent variable. Suppose the patient has develops bronchospasm due to the increased resistance. Anyway, the set volume will be delivered. The pressure peak will go up. So it's our responsibility to look at this value. Here it is written as PP, pressure peak. Sometimes some machines peak in respiratory pressure, PIP, etc. So we need to look into that particular value. And of course, we'll get other indicators also when you have intraoperative bronchospasm. Anyway, the message is we are controlling volume. Pressure is a dependent variable. Okay. So here is a summary, like here is the stable inspiratory flow rate, square flow waveform pattern. This is flow versus time scalar. The volume goes like this, reaches a peak, that is the set volume, and then proceed to exhalation. Similar change in pressure curve. It goes to the peak pressure when the maximum volume is attained, and then it goes to the exhalation phase. When the uh, bronchospasm or any a uh, respiratory compliance issue comes up, this pressure peak or P peak or PIP, maximum pressure will go up, keeping the volume constant because we are controlling the volume. Okay, this is another thing I would like you to uh, note because the other way, other uh, slide, actually the machine was showing one more value called P plat, plateau pressure. So how do you get the plateau pressure? You have to set modern anesthesia workstations, uh, machines like air stations, CS2. We can set uh, inspiratory pause. So during the inspiratory pause, this is the pressure peak. Okay, peak pressure. You give a slight uh, inspiratory pause, maybe 10 seconds of the cycle time. Then the pressure comes down to a plateau. So this is the pressure which is reflected at the lung units and this is called the plateau pressure. When you are discussing about the lung injury, barotrauma and all, we are mostly worried about this plateau pressure than the peak pressure. The difference between peak pressure and the plateau pressure is, indica is indicating the resistive pressure that is the work done to overcome the airway resistance. And this is the elastic pressure. This is the work done against the lung compliance okay this we'll come to this graphic again when we speak about driving pressure that we'll come to uh, driving pressure a little later so volume control mode any change in respiratory system compliance or resistance will result in modifications of airway pressures without affecting the delivery of the preset tidal volume one exception is when the high pressure limit is reached then the volume may not be delivered it's our responsibility to see that um, the pressures are monitored. Minute ventilation is guaranteed independent of the changes in airway compliance and resistance. And volume control mode is particularly useful during anesthesia in surgical procedures that affect the respiratory system compliance. For example, change in patient's position, peritoneal CO2 insufflation for laparoscopy or uh, use of abdominal retractors. Okay. Now you come to the second mode, pressure control ventilation. In this mode, actually now we are going to control or set a inspiratory pressure. Here, the volume, tidal volume delivered becomes a dependent variable. Here we are controlling the pressure, volume is a dependent variable. So we will be setting the inspiratory pressure, we will be setting the respiratory rate, IE ratio, positive end expiratory pressure, if required, we can keep and Pmax be usually set. Here you can note the difference. It is not the square wave pattern in the flow, inspiratory flow. It is a decelerating flow pattern, okay? So the breath cycle, if you see, it attains the set pressure limit or inspiratory pressure, then goes to a, maintains that pressure until the cycling, that is the changeover from inspiration to expiration that is called the cycling occurs, then it is maintained, then it goes to the exhalation phase. So here also pressure peak will be usually what the pressure control we are setting plus 
sweep what we are setting. Okay. Here we have to monitor the tidal volume and minute volume because when a compliance issue or resistance issue comes, the set pressure will be kept constant. Correspondingly, volume will be lesser. So in case of uh, maybe a peritoneal insufflation or a bronchospasm, we need to monitor this apart from, of course, the other indicators. Okay. So this is the decelerating flow. Specific use of pressure control mode will be, it will be very useful and well tolerated for ventilating children using supraglottic devices such as uh, LMAs. And because of its association with reduced peak airway pressures, PCV helps to reduce air leak and gastric insufflation. For uh, supraglottic airways, we don't need uh, higher airway pressures. It can result in gastric insufflation. So these are the points we need to keep in mind. PCV does not guarantee minute ventilation. PCV does not allow the determination of respiratory system compliance, resistance, etc. While using pressure control ventilation, the flow time curve should be continuously monitored to adjust the optimal inspiratory and expiratory times. So anyway, in anesthesia, in our specialty, there is no replacement for continued vigilance and monitoring. We cannot take anything for granted. Okay, modern anesthesia workstations, the ventilators are mostly as good as our ICU ventilators. For example, this ventilator, we have the volume control ventilation, pressure control ventilation, pressure control volume guaranteed, the SAME modes with the volume control, pressure control, and pressure support ventilation, the PSV Pro mode is there. So depending on the use, we, we can switch the different uh, switch among different modes of ventilation. The message I would like to emphasize here is, like we thought a few decades ago, ventilation under anesthesia is not always controlled ventilation because immobility is a uh, foundation principle of anesthesia, but not paralysis. We may not use neuromuscular blockers for all agents, we might cause respiratory depression using our anesthetic agent, but that doesn't mean that we can always go for a control mode ventilation. Plus, patient under regional anesthesia, plus general anesthesia, we can always have assist control mode kind of sophisticated modes to cater to the demands by the patient. Just to augment his uh, breathing, reduce his work of breathing and synchronize you with his efforts that can make the ventilation much better. Here is uh, what happens during pressure control volume guaranteed. So here you can see the pressure control mode ventilation. Now I'm planning to switch over to PCV volume guaranteed mode. So I'm switching over to volume guaranteed. Here I am not setting the pressure, I am setting the volume. Okay, I have set a tidal volume of 425. I have set a respiratory rate of 14. IA ratio 1, 1 is 2, T5. So here you can see that uh, this is pressure control mode ventilation with a decelerating flow pattern. This is where the switch over to pressure control PCV volume guaranteed happen. I have set a tidal volume of 425. The machine switches over to volume control mode to see how much pressure is required to generate or to deliver a tidal volume of 425. And once the pressure value is known, then it switches over to pressure control mode ventilation with that particular pressure as the inspiratory pressure. Okay, here you can see the graphics is seen like a pressure control mode ventilation. It's a decelerating flow pattern. So whatever advantage you have with pressure control mode, like increased sustenance of lung inflation, better distribution of lung volumes into different zones, all this we can achieve. Plus the volume, tidal volume or minute ventilation is guaranteed. In case something happens, the compliance changes, the machine will reset or increase or change the pressure control value uh, so that the set tidal volume is delivered. So that's the beauty of uh, pressure control volume guarantee.
Now I'll quickly rush through uh, some details we need to focus on setting each parameters. How about tidal volume? It's a conventional belief that uh, what is the tidal volume you are setting? Most of the residents will uh, easily say that it's uh, 10 ml per kg. How about a 70 kg patients? 700 ml. Usually many people are not hesitating to uh, put 700 ml on the settings and keep a respiratory rate of 12 or 14. So we need to understand that growing evidence suggests that large tidal volume ventilation without PEEP increases alveolar inflammation and can adversely affect the lung. Okay, again, large tidal volume has more adverse hemodynamic consequences as well. Under positive pressure ventilation, the cardiac output is reduced proportionally to the tidal volume. So for all these reasons, we consider that anything, something to the range of 10 mL per kg of body weight should be avoided because it exposes the patient to the risk of both low cardiac output and pulmonary over distension. So a reduction to maybe six to eight mL per kg is advised for patients susceptible to lung injury. Again, I would like to emphasize that the kg, the body weight is not the actual body weight. Okay, it is the predicted body weight. Okay, just because somebody is um, maybe a, a man of weight of maybe 80 kg during <clears throat> his lockdown period inactivity, he grows into maybe 95 kg or 100 kg. His lung is not growing. It's only the fat and uh, uh, peripheral tissues are uh, getting uh, more weight. So we, we can't injure the lung. So the idea is to limit the tidal volume to six to eight ml per kg predicted body weight. The, uh, the aim is to reduce the occurrence of postoperative pulmonary complications and thus improve the clinical outcome. Okay, there are different formula to calculate the predicted body weight. Nowadays, if the internet easily accessible, there are different applications helping you to calculate the predicted body weight depending on the height of the patient. Okay, and what about uh, positive end expiratory pressure PEEP that will keep the airways open even at the end of expiration. So this helps to compensate for anesthesia induced reduction in the FRC. This prevents end expiratory lung volume from dropping below the closing capacity and subsequently prevents small airways from collapsing. P prevents repeated opening and closure of small airways and helps to avoid adverse consequences of progressive lung de-recruitment, which is a possibility as the duration of ventilation goes forward. PEEP increases the end inspiratory lung volume and it reduces the venous return to the right heart. And consequently, the cardiac output is also effectively um, slightly, there, is, there will be some effects of uh, instituting PEEP. So PEEP should be used with caution in patients with hypovolemia and those with the right ventricular dysfunction. Again, it should be avoided when the intracranial hypertension is a concern. The current literature suggests that most anesthetized patients can benefit from a small level of PEEP because it improves gas exchanges and helps to prevent ventilator-induced pulmonary damages. The only large randomized trial that has investigated the effects of PEEP alone plus recruitment maneuvers in non-obese patients failed to show a reduction in the incidence of postoperative pulmonary complications and reported a higher incidence of intraoperative hemodynamic instability. So you cannot, you need not use PEEP and recruitment maneuvers as a routine practice, but rather keep it as a reserve in your armamentarium as a rescue strategy to overcome an unexpected impairment of gas exchange. Okay, so it need not be part of your routine practice, but it is a rescue strategy. It applies to PEEP as well as the recruitment maneuvers. So PEEP, is it always necessary? Because of our uh, circuits um, uh, construction and all, and it's a continuous flow anesthesia machine we are using, even without applying external PEEP, there is always a slight amount of PEEP generated in our anesthesia breathing circuits. 
say one or two centimeters of water. Plus, when it is deemed necessary, you can add PEEP from your anesthesia ventilator. So, so far, no strong evidence supports the routine use of PEEP under anesthesia. For my uh, junior colleagues and uh, postgraduates, I would like to emphasize this point, driving pressure. In anesthesia, we don't always ventilate ASA 1 and 2 patients. Definitely, we'll be taking care of patients ASA 3 and 4 or patients with increased risk factors for postoperative pulmonary complications. So it's not only reserved for ARDS patients in the ICU, basically ICU ventilation, we are trying to reduce or avoid the uh, physician-induced or ventilator-induced lung injury at the maximum. Okay, so driving pressure is what drives the air or the mixture of gases into the lung. So how lung reacts, we'll come to know from the graphics. So I have already shown the highest pressure value attained is called pressure peak or peak pressure. You give a small inspiratory pause, it comes, equilibrates to a lower pressure that is the peak plateau. And when you apply peak, the baseline from zero gets lifted up to say five centimeter of water means, peak of five centimeter of water means the baseline gets higher by uh, corresponding to five centimeters of water. So this pressure difference between plateau pressure and the PEEP is what drives the gas mixture into the lung. The higher the driving pressure, the more or uh, the severe will be the postoperative lung outcomes. So in mechanical ventilation, we always try to reduce the driving pressure, preferably less than 15 centimeters of water. Otherwise, if you are concentrating on plateau pressure, our target is somewhere around 27 to 28 centimeters of water. We'll deal with it in uh, the subsequent modules on mechanical ventilation. But my point is, even under anesthesia, whether the patient comes from ICU or a patient has risk factors, we need to keep all these factors in mind, especially when your machine is ready to give you the value of plateau pressure and the calculated PEEP. So we can always calculate the driving pressure and adjust your tidal volume settings accordingly. Driving pressure is the result of interaction between the ventilator and the respiratory system. And because of its strong correlation with the clinical outcome, it should be kept as low as possible. Because literature shows that whenever the driving pressure exceeds 15, 16 or 17, the 30-day mortality, et cetera, are shown to be higher from critical care patients. An intraoperative increase in driving pressure at a given tidal volume reflects a lower respiratory system complaints. You try to troubleshoot it, but while you are troubleshooting it, see that driving pressure is kept low by reducing your set tidal volume. So this might be an expression of an altered lung, chest wall, abdominal interaction, such as during the induction of pneumoperitoneum, or in contrast, a loss of lung aeration, which may be reversed with recruitment maneuvers. Okay, how to do recruitment maneuvers? Sometimes you would have noticed that um, after you give general anesthesia for cesarean section, the, tidal, uh, the saturation dips. Okay, in such cases, when there is a sudden atelectasis causing more venous admixture and more hypoxemia, recruitment maneuvers are indicated, but definitely not as a routine practice. They are often performed by switching the ventilator to manual mode and then changing, setting maximum pressure with the APL valve and then keep the back squeezed for some time, then release, then continue with the ventilation. This is the plan A where we will be closing the APL valve fully, switch to manual mode, keep the back squeezed, and then you can find that uh, uh, the lung units are opening up. Second option, option B is to stepwise increase the tidal volume or PEEP. That also will help. Statistically, there is no nothing much to choose between the plan A and plan B, but in plan A, you can see that there is a small transient dip after your recruiting. So maybe the plan B might have slight edge because it's a sustained improvement or opening up of 
lung units. Recruitment maneuvers have uh, an undoubted efficacy as rescue interventions to revert intraoperative desaturation due to alveolar collapse, but there is little evidence to recommend its use on a routine preventive basis. Okay. Now, how to set the uh, respiratory rate? To set target desired PaCO2 or ETCO2, uh, we can set the respiratory rate accordingly. Generally, we try to maintain ETCO2 of around 35 to 40. Usually, the ETCO2 and PaCO2 will hold a constant relationship. A high respiratory rate reduces the expiratory time, which is more important, especially when you are dealing with a COPD patient or elderly patient. Just to wash out CO2, many people will increase the respiratory rate very high in effectively the expiratory time available. The time available to wash out CO2 also gets reduced and potentially induces intrinsic PEEP. I believe everybody is comfortable with the term intrinsic PEEP, that is auto PEEP. Simply speaking, it is the air trapping because of the inadequate exhalation. So these are the problems when you increase respiratory rate beyond a particular limit. Optimal PSEO2 during anesthesia depends on both the type of surgery and the patient's pre-existing conditions. For example, intracranial neurosurgery requires a PSEO2 between 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury when intracranial hypertension is suspected and we definitely hyperventilate a little bit. The effect is not sustained for long time. That also we have to keep in mind. Patients with COPD may benefit from permissive hypercapnia to avoid volutrauma and barotrauma because their baseline PaCO2 will be high. So you can't imagine that everybody's PaCO2 should be 40 because we have induced and patient is coming for a surgery. It's not an ICU management. You should remove that thinking. Each patient will have his or her own baseline. You have to respect the baseline and treat or manage, keep your settings accordingly. Regarding FiO2, the inspired oxygen fraction. This is basically intended to compensate for anesthesia induced gas exchange impairment. Again, you need to keep in mind that oxygen is toxic for tracheobronchial tree and the lung. High FiO2 favor absorption atelectasis. Use of high FiO2 maybe 80% versus 0.35 results in increased incidence of wound infections and post-operative, reduced incidence of, of wound infection and post-operative complications. But this is not a generalized way. Only a few studies for, uh, for following major laparotomy showed this, but uh, still now evidence is not good enough to extrapolate this to all surgeries. It is shown to reduce the incidence of uh, post-op nausea vomiting. It can, however, be hypothesized that high oxygen tension could provide some degree of perioperative cardiovascular protection also similar to hemodynamic effects of beta blockers. But again, there is no strong evidence to support this statement. Now, the use of pressure support ventilation. I already shown some of the anesthesia ventilators give you the option of PSV Pro. This is just to reduce the work of breathing related to airway device resistance. This helps to counteract the respiratory depressant effects of anesthetic medications and to support ventilation during emergence from anesthesia, which will be uh, very much in line with the patient's efforts. It's you often used with the supraglottic airway devices in place. So peak pressures can be kept between 15 to 20 centimeters to avoid leakage around the supraglottic airways and to cause uh, to avoid gastric insufflation. With most anesthesia machines, minimum respiratory rate can be set as a backup. That is the pro part of it. In case patient goes to hypopneic or apneic, machine will switch over to the backup mode. So how do you choose the mode of ventilation? Depends on patient factors, surgical procedures, and of course the available technology. The pressure control ventilation, PCV or PCV volume guaranteed may be preferred when a supraglottic airway is in place or in patients in whom high inspiratory pressures may be dangerous, like in emphysema, neonates, and infants. PCV volume guaranteed may be preferred to maintain minute ventilation in patients with high or changing intraabdominal pressures like morbid obesity, laparoscopic surgeries, thoracoscopy, and pregnancy. 
monitoring respiratory uh, pulmonary mechanics most of the new anesthesia ventilators will provide you with the flow volume loops and uh, other respiratory mechanics indicators parameters you can monitor the flow pressure volume so you can assess the uh, ventilation either directly or uh, by providing means of calculating variables there will be different variables provided in the uh, graphical chart so monitoring we can monitor the uh, pressure volume loops flow volume loops so in addition to etco2 as an indicator we can even use the flow volume loops to find out the bronchospasm elements and other conditions developing intraoperatively lung protective ventilation during anesthesia is a concept which i have been trying to uh, emphasize because uh, this is also important in all the populations and to reduce the pulmonary strain during or due to our mechanical ventilation low tidal volumes or driving pressures can reduce the stress and strain peep can keep the lung open and recruitment maneuvers when required can reopen collapsed alveoli some patients might require post operative assistance because our general anesthesia and our post operative analgesia can affect the mucociliary clearance frc surfactant production immune response and even the cough reflex may be impaired it, uh, other cause may be the post operative residual curarization so all these modifications can lead to post operative pulmonary complications so such patients and such conditions will require post operative assistance in the last decade several studies have been focused on post perioperative care aimed at preventing uh, post operative pulmonary complications integrated multidisciplinary protocols applied before or after surgery based on early mobilization chest physiotherapy semi recumbent position and coughing and deep breathing exercises seem to have advantages in terms of pulmonary complication prevention something about uh, niv support non invasive respiratory support uh it can be either in the form of cpap or bipap it can rapidly relieve the dyspnea or breathlessness subjectively it can improve it can reduce the work of breathing and it can help avoid reintubation in patients in whom respiratory failure has an underlying transient and modifiable cause so nav has the ability to re expand the collapsed areas of the lung Uh, it has also a role as a preventive measure in high risk patients or in patients developing mild pulmonary complications to avoid further deterioration of the respiratory function so cpap can be provided with high flow systems with a dedicated or general purpose ventilators stand alone devices that only require an oxygen source to deliver cpap are becoming more and more available in our anesthesia practice so nav support compared with standard oxygen therapy nav reduces the short term reintubation rate cpap or bipap should always be considered to avoid reintubation in patients developing hypoxic respiratory failure after surgery while when hypercapnia is predominant or coexists with hypoxemia bipap should be preferred another option is high flow nasal oxygen hfnc devices are usually well tolerated because they are giving high flow but humidified oxygen and it is heated to body temperature so they can be used with small dedicated humidified flow generators which can potentially also be used in the surgical ward in a study of cardiothoracic surgery patients hfncs were found to be non inferior to nav in reducing reintubation rate so the clinical indications of hfnc would be to improve Uh, improving the pre oxygenation right from pre oxygenation phase we can consider this device it can uh, in providing ongoing oxygenation and co2 removal for patients during intubation especially while doing a prolonged intubation attempt in awake oral or nasal fiber optic or videoscopic intubation we can use hfncs to maintain oxygenation providing oxygenation reducing work of breathing and facilitating co2 elimination for use during surgical procedures like uh, uh, bronchoscopy or laryngeal surgery and it can also provide respiratory support after extubation in the post anesthesia care unit so in a nutshell mechanical ventilation under anesthesia we have discussed the rationale of why you need a mechanical ventilation under anesthesia different modes how to set the parameters and uh, a few things about the recent trends with that i conclude my uh, lecture thank you very much for the opportunity and it's uh, um, over to uh, 
and Dr. Sega. Thank you, Dr. Sinish, for such a nice, well-illustrated lecture that you took just now. I'm sure people must be appreciating that. So there are lots of questions in the question box, but I think before we go to that, we will have some questions for the audience, Dr. Sinish. Yeah, in fine. Okay. So, um, now we'll be getting the audience into action now. Because now it's your opportunity to um, tell us how far we were successful in delivering our messages. So the, here is the first question, audience poll question. Uh, I think those who are viewing in the mobile devices, you might uh, have some problem once I put the poll window on. So before that, I'll read out the question and the options. Increased lung compliance is associated with option A, increasing age. Option B, increasing pulmonary venous pressure. Option C, high expanding volumes. Option D, interstitial fibrosis. Option E, low lung volumes associated with hypoventilation. So you are expected to select the single best answer. Your poll window is on your screen now. Happy that people are uh, quickly responding to the questions. Wait for another uh, 10 seconds more. So I'll read out the question and options once again for those who are viewing from the mobile device. Increased lung compliance is associated with option A, increasing age, increasing pulmonary venous pressure, high expanding volumes, interstitial fibrosis option D, Option E, low lung volumes associated with hypoventilation. So I am ending the poll now. Okay, now it's time for the answers. I think uh, Dr. Sumesh can continue. Okay, hopefully I'm still audible. Yeah, very, very yeah. much. Okay, right, yeah. So increasing age and uh, conditions like emphysema, we saw that there was a decrease, I mean, loss of elastic tissue, and this might uh, increase the lung compliance. We are talking about compliance. So uh, the other things were already discussed. So increasing pulmonary venous pressure, no. Uh, it would uh, actually reduce the volume. And uh, higher expanding volumes, as the volume goes on increasing, the resistance, which is the opposite of compliance, would increase, not interstitial fibrosis. And uh, the final thing was just, uh, 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 you know, placebo. So it's already a low lung volume associated with hypoventilation. Right. I guess we can go on to the next question. Okay. Question two. With regard to pulmonary function, option A, tidal volume is the volume of each maximal inspiration. Option B, residual volume is the volume remaining at the end of passive expiration. Option C, residual volume can be measured directly. Option D, vital capacity is equivalent to the total inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume. Option E, tidal volume is measured by the single breath nitrogen technique. the poll window is on now. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, I think another 10 seconds we can wind up the poll. OK, 
there is a report right when we look at the answers so yeah can we go to the answer right so i think most of you have got it right you know the tidal volume is the volume of the normal quiet breathing not the maximal inspiration which is the inspiratory capacity the residual volume is the volume remaining at the end of a forced expiration and the residual volume cannot be measured directly you have to measure the frc and the uh, expiratory reserve volume and uh, frc minus erv would give you the residual volume yes the vital capacity is equal to the total inspiratory reserve volume tidal volume and the expiratory reserve volume the tidal volume is not what is measured by a single breath nitrogen technique you would get that from the directly from the spirometry itself what you measure by uh, nitrogen technique helium dilution technique the body box etc is the frc functional residual capacity okay now there are some more questions in the question answer box should i look at that also now or no we'll we'll finish yeah, the audience fine. round and then come back fine fine that okay so moving to the question number 3 this is multiple response question pick out the true statements okay option a in volume control uh, mode ventilation gas distribution in the lung may be uneven particularly in patients with lung disease option b during pressure control mode ventilation tidal volume varies with changes in lung compliance option c pressure support ventilation mode helps to reduce the work of breathing and to support ventilation during emergence from anesthesia option d driving pressure is defined as the difference between peak pressure and peep you have the poll window in front of you now multiple response questions click on all the options which you feel are true basically it's a true or false with each statement yeah fine winding up in another 10 seconds sorry for uh, rushing through okay fine so here is the result regarding option c i think there is maximum consensus 77% believes that pressure support mode helps to reduce the work of breathing and to support ventilation during emergency okay um surprised why only 44% believes that uh, a is correct actually it's a true statement in volume control mode ventilation gas dis distribution in the lung may be uneven particularly in patients with lung disease that's where pressure control ventilation has an edge regarding option b during pressure control mode ventilation tidal volume varies with changes in lung compliance that's true i think 63% agrees with that 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 is a problem tidal volume keeps on varying because it's a dependent variable regarding the last statement driving pressure is defined as the difference between peak pressure and peep no it is false it's plateau pressure and peep okay i think that uh, message is clear okay only the option d statement d was wrong other options were correct so there is one more question for the audience pick out the true statements on lung protective ventilation during anesthesia multiple response again option a aims to reduce alveolar over distension this is regarding lung protective ventilation during anesthesia option b helps to prevent cyclic atelectasis or to prevent atelect trauma option c low tidal volumes and reduce plateau and bar or driving pressures option d use of peep or recruitment maneuvers option e not beneficial for patients without lung injury so there are five statements basically it's a true false uh, issue with each question here is the poll window now
good to see that some people are responding very quickly maybe because i am reading slow or you are thinking fast anyway it's good fine winding up in another 10 seconds thank you very much for your support and uh, cooperation because you have been active and uh, you are giving your inputs in the chat box also there are good enough uh, questions and comments thank you for that so i am ending the poll now yes i think the message is clear uh, good number majority agrees that the statements a b c d are true because these are lung protective ventilation strategies it aims to reduce alveolar oval distension prevents cyclic atelectasis low tidal volumes and reduce plateau pressure driving pressures are desirable use of peep or recruitment maneuvers might help and the statement e is not correct we cannot say that just because patient has no lung injury it is not beneficial for patients so there may be risk factors so it should be a routine habit to uh, use lung protective ventilation strategies under anesthesia because the first and foremost principle in modern medicine is primum non nocere do no harm okay it's uh, over to the moderators for the remaining part of the q and a session okay so Thank we you. are already have so many questions in the question answer box shall we go with that yeah yeah yes so please comment on thoraco abdominal versus abdomino thoracic breathing pattern in pregnancy also dr sumesh yeah uh, interesting question but it's slightly out of the uh, you know scope of this discussion anyways you know that normally you would like the breathing to be maximally thoracic usually it's thoracic thoraco abdominal for all of us various conditions as well as in supine patients it might become more abdomino thoracic and the last thing is pregnancy it would uh, you know completely spleen the abdomen and uh, push up the diaphragm reduce the intrathoracic volume increase the intrathoracic pressure uh, the next question was is there a role of artificial surfactant in arbs due to covid very interesting there have been i mean there is a flurry of studies coming out on covid now uh, covid is basically a, a case of severe ards with uh, membrane disruption as well as an endothelial injury so the entire gas exchange and gas transport is what is affected but still as a severe ards people have yes tried uh, artificial surfactant for ventilation they think that uh, starting surfactant therapy early might help in severe ards interestingly there is also a kl4 uh, surfactant which has been newly manufactured and is being tried for patients with uh, on covid ventilation the next question was please explain the functional residual capacity again uh, i think uh, uh, best done by the uh, textbooks i mean uh, it was already dealt with both by uh, dr sanish and i it's basically the oxygen reservoir or the uh, residual capacity that you have for the or the time available that you have for the apneic period where you would manipulate the airway and attain airway control so that's the importance of the frc for us and frc is increased and decreased by various factors which you should also know the next one was the graph of uh, the slide pick of Uh, lung on closing capacity i can actually put up the slides for download by all the participants i think i'll do that immediately after this the causes of ventilation perfusion mismatch this will be dealt with in detail in the next session coming the next week hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction please explain explain again a uh, very long theoretical discussion uh, basically it helps in uh, cases where there is regional uh, hypoxia and hypoventilation in the lungs so the physiological mechanism of for protection in cases of regional hypoxia is when those alveoli are collapsed or not getting ventilated the perfusion also is directed away from the affected lung towards the normal lung so that the ventilation perfusion ratio increases and comes back to more towards normal and uh, there are factors which affect the hypoxic <laughs> pulmonary vasoconstriction and can affect the recovery as well so just remember that hpv is a protective mechanism in regional hypoxia and hypoventilation but not in global hypoxia or hypoventilation that means not in severe ards now is it necessary to keep the patient in head up position after extubation in the post anesthesia care unit for various factors yes this would be desirable at least a 10 to 15 degrees head up tilt 
you are removing a little bit of the uh, thoracic splinting making it easier for respiratory excursions mm, opening up the airway and uh, decreasing the chance of secretions getting into the lungs should we preoxygenate with 100% or 30% i think that was the both in the chat as well as the questions that was the most contentious question so the conventional teaching and even practice i mean all of us practice uh, preoxygenation with 100% oxygen but then it has been seen uh, uh, the, those studies i put up were very much uh, descriptive it was seen by ct studies that 100% oxygen in a normal patient it does not give us any benefit we know that we can intubate easily so basically the raised fio2 is just to gain us more apnea time or more time for uh, airway maneuvers if we think we do not need that then yes it has been proved that uh, preoxygenation with fio2 of 30 to 50% is beneficial in terms of preventing atelectasis intraoperatively and doctor yes, can just put in a word i mean yeah. like you rightly said that 100% oxygen sometimes can be more harmful uh, right. because of the absorption and you know they can be collapse and they even recommend about 80% yes and like you said in a normal person but then unexpected intubation difficult intubation has been yes. emphasized yeah. on so much that all right. the residents tend to do with 100% oxygen right right but also right. it has been uh, highlighted that giving 100% or any 80 to 100% at the time of pre oxygenation is not as harmful as giving 100% at the time of extubation extubation yes because that's the time when you know patients can can get absorbed yes. and they can have more problems right. so the intubation time i think 80% will be very nice but even 100% yes. can be given if case demands so. right yes sir and as you very correctly put it so it is more harmful at the time of extubation than intubation so it's also a usual practice to give the patient 100% oxygen and a high flow of oxygen prior to extubation so we have already seen that that can also cause post operative atelectasis so and uh, yeah yes yes so coming uh, to last thing ma'am there is also theoretical considerations like oxygen toxicity as you approach yes. a higher fio2 the free radicals etc so yes so dr sanish i think will like to answer the next one how can we use peak and plateau pressure to differentiate lung pathologies lung compliance change from concussion um i think uh, if uh, you remember this graph of peak pressure then a inspiratory pause then plateau pressure and then it comes to a baseline either it's a peep or the difference between the plateau uh, peak pressure and the plateau pressure is the uh, it reflects the airway resistance so whenever there is an airway resistance issue a bronchospasm this difference goes up so in severe bronchospasm we might get a higher peak pressure but the plateau pressure may remain within limits because the lung compliance is reflected by plateau pressure but if it is a lung stiffening like ards or a pneumonia developing or a sudden pneumothorax developing suddenly the uh, plateau pressure goes up so if the plateau pressure goes up we have to reduce the tidal volume and troubleshoot and see what exactly causes the rise in the plateau pressure but if it is the peak pressure that is going up with uh, normal or acceptable plateau pressure we need to institute or troubleshoot what could be the reason in the airway airway resistance like if it is a bronchospasm bronchodilatation circuit kinking relieve the circuit kinking so like that you troubleshoot depending on two different um, scenarios plateau pressure is something to do with the lung parenchyma other one peak pressure only peak pressure is going up that is because of the airway resistance so here lies the importance of monitoring the lung mechanics with the newer yes. ventilators this possible but it might not be possible in every institute but this is how you will be able to diagnose many things if mechanics change intraoperatively yeah and like the screenshot i saw uh, showed in the slides the moment you put uh, 10% in and uh, inspiratory time pause then the plateau pressure automatically appears on your screen so you can see what is happening plus the newer ventilators will also give the pressure volume loops and all so we can uh, from the shape of it we can understand where it is an expiratory limitation or a severe bronchospasm developing or a severe restriction something happening during a pneumothorax so these um, volumes i usually tell my juniors and residents that uh, whenever you get a chance to anesthetize with a modern version of the anesthesia ventilator make it a point to see and learn these uh, scalars graphics loops and all 
because i see you you may be busy because patient may be uh, sick most of the time so this is an opportunity to familiarize with the graphics and uh, loops in a control settings actually i was surprised that some of the photographs i have shown was uh, uh, taken at uh, 2 am in the morning and all when we are doing a neurosurgery case so is so the next question i think if before you kindly explain sai maneuver or double tidal volume for recruitment yeah the sai maneuver actually i am not comfortable answering it because i have been used it because uh, some of the ventilators will give the sai maneuver for uh, recruitment maneuvers but um, so far i have been come across that option actually not the sai maneuver but uh, they describe different types of uh, uh, maneuvers to recruit the alveoli and the volume controlled ones they recommend you start with 6 to 8 ml per kg and then you add when you want to recruit then 4 ml per kg tidal volume every 6 to 10 breaths you slowly increase it Mm -hmm. and then let it be there for some breaths and then that is how you can recruit but that double tidal volume i don't know because that will be you know maybe the limit of increase in tidal volume okay. the next one is pcv vg mode better than uh, no this is one some actually i have explained during the lecture itself it's not uh, we can't say any mode is superior to another mode it uh, basically dictated by the patient characteristics and surgery characteristics and of course uh, you need to complement with your monitoring also so just because um, uh, you are putting in pcv vg mode you are uh, tidal volume is assured but you have to pick up the clues you have to know that the pressure set values are going up initially maybe uh, you have set a tidal uh, tidal volume of 400 the initial pressure control is shown on the machine was my a pressure peak of 16 when it goes to 25 still you might get a same tidal volume but you need to understand the difference like initially it was 6, uh, 20 now it is 25 the peak pressures are going up so something is happening so you have to um, um know they uh, get the message from the change in pressure also just because tidal uh, minute ventilation is guaranteed you can't sit tight because sometimes it may be because of the pneumoperitoneum or the change in patient positioning so monitoring is important rather than the mode of ventilation so you mentioned high flow nasal oxygenation but i think you did not touch on thrive so there's a question for you on that so what are the indications of thrive um, actually uh, thrive is another um, thrive. it's a sort of um, hfnc only but uh, it will be using 100% oxygen always the other optiflow and other options we, we have the option of uh, changing the fio2 thrive basically depends on the apneic oxygenation especially during the laryngeal surgery and all so basically during apnea what happens is oxygen uptake will be happening uh, say around 250 ml per minute though the carbon dioxide production is 200 ml per minute only 20 ml per minute will be coming out so actually there will be a gap of uh, minus 220 ml created every minute from the alveolar system so this negative pressure also sucks in air especially if you are flushing in high flow oxygen through the upper airways this will be taken up so this apneic oxygenation can maintain the oxygenation for a reasonable amount of time so that you can do the perform the surgery so you can i think some of the thrive machines they also right yes ma'am you yeah, know i was talking with the next i thought you're done with that okay. so can the you problem is the oxygenation may be maintained but there there may be a risk of co2 building up because uh, some of the machines they provide a transcutaneous co2 trending monitor so that will give you an idea how far we can maintain it's not only about maintaining apnea and keeping the saturation in acceptable limit CO2 build up is another thing that we might miss out. So I think some of the machines they are providing the transcutaneous CO2 monitoring also because CO2 will be building up during this apneic oxygenation. But this has changed our life. Some many of the procedures, rather than giving intermittent uh, ventilation with inhalation agents or short boluses of propofol and all, we can maintain it. We can sustain the apnea period for a longer duration, and we can. Uh, help in the surgery like laryngeal viewing or uh, bronchial procedures 
for a short reasonable duration i'm not sure about how far you can stretch i think more literature will have to come up personally i don't have much experience with the thrive so next uh, question is about hysteresis can you explain about hysteresis i think uh, dr sumesh can explain ഡ്യൂറിംഗ് breathe more spontaneously and open up the ventilation so is it safe to give head up during deep extubation um uh, again in practice it might be difficult but uh, basically in deep extubation your uh, concern is to keep the airway open so whatever maneuvers will make it easier for you to do that and uh, you know promote effective ventilation would be what you follow in the pre oxygenation and time constant ma'am i actually did not understand this question basically i don't know if she is asking about uh, the pre oxygenation and the time available so it's always a trade off so how long to do it probably she means that mm -hmm. okay the standard teaching is 3 uh, minutes with 100% oxygen so what we have just seen is that uh, that might actually be detrimental to a normal patient and uh, often uh, you know a normal patient does not i mean i'm, I'm just uh, saying this but it might be contentious does not even need pre oxygenation yes, to yeah. avoid complications yeah, i agree with you yes so the last question i think will be if we keep peep for thoracic spine surgery will it increase the blood loss due to increase intra thoracic pressure either will peep cause dural tear during spine surgery interesting dr sinish it's it's difficult to answer <laughs> because my personal experience with spine surgery is very less and theoretically the more intrathoracic pressure we keep more will be the epidural venous plexus distension and maybe a possibility of bleeding but uh, i think that effectively reduces the chance of air embolism also it's a trade off between the risk of bleeding because they, now we have good number of other options to add on to our armamentarium to reduce the bleeding by uh, proper you know, positioning one thing we can add that thoracic spine surgery is done in prone position which yeah. will help the okay. ventilation so to say these days you know prone ventilation is in vogue so yeah. i suppose that can be helpful and you need not need very high peep pressures in any yes. so i think we come to the end of the thing uh, no there is another one how much trigger you want to keep in volume control in adult patients yeah that, that's a good question because uh, um, anyway we'll be discussing it in our mechanical ventilation modules again um, it's a general habit to increase the trigger to suppress the breaths which is not good so generally accepted is either 1 to 2 cm of water should be a reasonable uh, trigger setting um, other extreme settings are rare i believe so uh, you cannot kill a patient's efforts by raising the trigger to maybe 5 or more but we have to we have good enough measures like adding an opioid or a, another sedative agent to reduce, if you want to suppress the breaths you have to do that if during weaning if the patient is tachypneic you have to go and search for the reason for uh, the tachypnea and probably patient is not good enough for uh, weaning at that point of time so um, we don't try to play around with the trigger setting we usually keep it at around 1 to 2 cm of uh, water most of the time uh, that's our uh, institution's practice thank you dr sinish i think i will um, ask dr venu gopal to wind up we have had a very nice session uh, no, dr vijesh your yeah. mic is muted hello yes, yes sir okay. yes yeah. dr remainder yes sir yes sir yes dr radha uh, will you say about the change in plans yes yes no i thought dr venukopal might want to say something before we finish yeah okay yeah, hello 
Yes. Actually, we have uh, dealt with all the questions that has come up in the chat box. And we had a wonderful uh, exposition of uh, respiratory physiology by both the speakers. It was uh, really wonderful to uh, refresh on the physiological aspects of uh, the respiratory system. And I think uh, it was explained so wonderfully that almost all of us had a wonderful class. And uh, since we have done all the questions, I would request uh, ma'am to wind up the session. Yes, yeah, so okay. So I think uh, everybody agrees that we had a very nice session. Now, there's been a slight change in the program for next week. Next Wednesday, we have this webinar at the same time, but the topic is going to be mechanical ventilation, basic concepts. We will continue with the respiratory physiology later in uh, maybe next month, but at the moment, we will be starting the basic concepts of mechanical ventilation next week. And the chief instructor will be Dr. T. R. Chandrasekhar. Thank you all. Thank you. I, on behalf of you, both chef and moderators, Dr. Vengupal and myself, I thank both the speakers for excellent lectures and all the participants for their active participation, asking questions and putting up chat box dialogues. Thank you very much and good night. Dr. Radhakrishnan, would you like to say something at the end? Yeah. Thank you all faculty members, Raminder, Vijesh, Sanish, Sumesh. Thank you all for the excellent conduct of the show. And the participants, you are our supporter, and we will be there with you. Owing to certain personal problems, we are not having the respiratory module part two next week. Instead, we are introducing the mechanical ventilation. And we will be doing with the respiratory physiology as we go along. Once again, thank you all, and good night. Good night, sir. Good night, everybody. <laughs>